it's not just a story of gardens in a way and all the different kinds of gardens there have been, it's also a story of civilization that we're telling. Before European, it was uh, Hamilton Gardens was the site of a pretty significant par called Taparapara, roughly on the location of the existing Taparapara Garden, just a little bit south of that. And then it was gradually uh, developed for all sorts of things. There was a narrows redoubt at the eastern end of the site that was defending the township. The main area at the top was a town belt, and down below in the gully was a rifle range. And there's people my age and a little older who remember Boys Height um, going there for shooting practice. My first memory of the site was uh, when my, I came here with my father bringing the remains of my rocket ship. I had a rocket ship on the back lawn that, that the main idea was to take a photograph of it with lots of smoke but it caught fire. The cat escaped fortunately, had a week's supply of food for different you know, orbits um, and my father would have naturally said let's clean all that crap off the lawn and brought it down here and so I remember the site while my father was off talking because dumps in those days was a major recreation activity going to the dump you meet all sorts of people there um, while he was off talking to someone I started loading all sorts of neat stuff back on the trailer my father was a bit horrified he didn't want to be seen leaving the dump with stuff collected from the dump so I had to unload it all again unfortunately I uh, became involved as a landscape architect in the late 70s and one of my first jobs was to do a management plan reserves that they're required under the reserves act for all parks in New Zealand so writing the management plan for it. And um, I suppose it wasn't a usual management plan that usually they're sort of more policy documents. It was an idea for development with sketches. Most of the design is done at home and, and all these images and the, the plans are all done on the dining room table. I've got a long suffering wife who's most of our marriage life we've had plans all over the dining room table, sort of working on them gradually and thinking about them as, as they're drawn up and uh, that was approved by council but council didn't really make any separate budget available to actually make it it was really the community that picked up on that uh, first of all the combined garden clubs made the building we're in the big pavilion raised money for that and lobbied for some council money and the Wintec uh, horticultural school moved here um, and then early early development very much with those subsidized gate labor schemes donated materials donated bricks concrete, uh, th there was an endless supply of broken concrete. In fact, whenever most contractors in town knew that if they were getting rid of broken concrete, they brought it here up on the hill. That, that helped make the massive foundations that we need for some of these walls over the old dump site. They just um, massive foundations un under some of those structures. The concept for the gardens has evolved. The first management plan was probably more influenced by the big German garden shows right through the 50s and 60s. The German states would all each year sort of compete and have a, a, a usually a bombed out site where they developed a, a garden and uh, some friends and I travelled around and saw those on, on the OE and it just showed you didn't have to have plants as a theme for a garden. A garden could have all these other dimensions. So initially it was probably more influenced by that but then we really cottoned on to the idea of this garden history that no one had done it, that it was a real point of difference and it had all these different dimensions. The advantage of the concept is it can engage people who aren't necessarily interested in gardens or plants. So at the gardens we decided 
to tell a story, to have a narrative that tied things together. So it still has plant collections and sculptures and things, but it's got a narrative that ties it together, and that is the story of gardens. And we're pretty confident now that no one else in the world has done that. The big thing about gardens is they, it's, it's an art form. It's not just plants. It's a, it's a very old art form. And probably as much as any art form, apart from perhaps drama and literature, it tells you a lot about the communities that created it. It's particularly in the early gardens, you can see religious beliefs, different perceptions of what paradise it's like, um, the arts, attitudes to nature, science, maths, you know, it's, it's all there in the gardens when you know where to look. And we've taken a particular point in history for a particular type of garden. So it moves from those ancient Egyptian gardens and Persian um, and Syrian gardens, medieval gardens, Roman gardens, uh, early Vedic, early um, Indian civilization. They're broken down into five collections. One is the fantasy garden collection, and that's the different forms of fantasy that have inspired most innovation in garden design. Well, there's nine panels in this garden representing different land uses. It's sort of inspired by a key on the old school atlas. And then on the wall there's a, a whakatoki that says, uh, refers to man dominating the landscape on the steel pipe that says uh, the, the, the steel pipe will gradually rust away and that says that in the, but in the end nature will win. This is the Mansfield Garden. It's a sort of early 20th century New Zealand garden. A lot of the elements are typical of that. But it's also referring to um, Catherine Mansfield's famous story, The Garden Party. So they're just getting ready to set up the garden party. We've got a tennis court here with a marquee with all the food set out and the, the bands there. Everything's ready for the party to begin. Shinisri Garden is, is sort of inspired by Chinese pottery. Then there's the Productive Garden Collection. So you've got things like the Pacifica Garden and the Kitchen Garden, uh, the, the Par Paramari Garden. So the relationship between people and plants. Then there's the Paradise Garden Collection, and that's different perceptions of paradise. This is the Italian Renaissance Garden, one of a collection of the Paradise Garden Collection. It is a, certainly a very formal garden, and uh, really very much based on their discoveries of mathematics, and so you, you have that. With these gardens, we don't just pick an Italian Renaissance garden, we try and have a particular type. In this case, we, we chose a designer called Vignola and really uh, tried to use uh, elements that he would have used. But in other cases, we've got a uh, Japanese garden of contemplation where you look for an inner peace, an inner paradise. or the uh, Chaba Garden, Indian Chaba Garden, which was a symbolic paradise with four rivers coming out of a central source. You can see, see that in the Quran and uh, Genesis in the Bible and in ancient Indian cosmology, you can see that very ancient source of, of paradise. The development of Hamilton Gardens has been driven very much by the community. The council uh, funds ongoing maintenance, but most development has been sponsored. So we had a, in those days there was a herb society to help with the herb garden, rose society helping with the rose garden, community garden. And then the, the, there were ethnic communities. So one of the first gardens to be developed was the Chinese garden, Chinese scholars garden. And that was really because the local Chinese community wanted to make a garden and we had a sister city. And so there was a real opportunity to make a Chinese garden. And to some degree they chose the best site. We have, a, I think, a couple of thousand bookings a year, ranging in size. A lot of them, I think about two-thirds of them, using the Central Events Pavilion. We sort of really enjoy where an event uses the garden and in an appropriate way. So in a, a prime case of that is the Hamilton Gardens Arts Festival, and where some of the events relate to the, the garden. So you might have a, a sort of modern play in the modernist garden or opera in the Italian Renaissance garden. Th those sort of events and it can really transform that event. The rate of development of new gardens depends on sponsorship. Costs have, have uh, certainly increased. Even in the last couple of years the engineers designed for foundations have uh, massively increased and, and huge budgets. 
So in the early days, we were making gardens like the uh, Chinese scholars garden for about 80,000 and you certainly wouldn't do that now. Some of these more ambitious gardens are, you know, the best part of a million dollars. So the whole, the whole development, you're talking uh, something in the region of, um, well, we, in the 10 year plan, it's got 25 million, but that's relying on 15 million in sponsorship. And to finish the gardens, it's probably over 30 million. So it is an ambitious thing. But against that, you've got to think that every year it generates an economic benefit conservatively of 20 million, going up to 30. Uh, some economists think that's twice that. So uh, very good investment in, in terms of a return to the community. Well, people have different um, sort of information needs. Some are happy to just come and look at flowers, which is fine. And some are happy with just the information on the sides and then there's the guidebook. And then we're gradually developing, there's an app, but we're gradually developing other, other layers of meaning. There are a lot of different layers of meaning. You certainly you, you meet people who are Hamiltonians who have been to the gardens a million times. And then they do one of the tours and discover a whole lot more. And certainly the more people understand the gardens, the more they appreciate them and, and enjoy them, I think. Thank you.